The Elon Twitter saga is not ending. There are some technical improvements uh, in the works, but Elon is still very um, bold on Twitter, uh, which isn't the most advertiser-friendly thing to uh, point it out in a very calm way. And um, the economy doesn't look too great with all the uncertainties uh, surrounding the Fed, for example, also. And in the Tesla camp, the Tesla success story continues with uh, the semi-rollout. So a lot of headlines right now that are very interesting. And to help us guide through this financial space, uh, I've invited Ross Gerber to the podcast. And uh, Ross, I'm very glad you allocated some time uh, to this small podcast here. And uh, maybe you can tell us something about uh, what you do and uh, what's your background. That would be interesting for the audience. Yeah, my name is Ross Gerber. I'm an investment advisor and investor. Um, I run a firm called Gerber Kawasaki Wealth Investment Management, and I run the GK ETF. Um, as an investor, my main focus has always been technology and as technology is advanced and as the world's changed now, climate investments, which I also consider technology, um, has become a large portion of what we do. So about 25% of our investments are in, um, technology and about 25% in EV and climate change investments. And then the rest is spread between real estate, consumer companies and industrials and such, um, so as an uh, investment advisor, we at my firm advise about 11,000 clients. I manage over $2 billion in assets, um, and I oversee trading and investing for our firm and for my clients and for myself. And I've been an investor since I was 13 years old. Uh, so I started wow. investing as a kid. Yeah, and my, my parents taught me how to save and invest in that's stocks awesome. like Apple and Disney. And, and so that's what I do at my firm is I teach people. We have yeah. no minimums, and we teach people globally – how to save and invest their money for the future and and build wealth. Wow, that's that's great. Um, uh, it's very interesting because the investment strategies of the Germans is so d different. And uh, my parents taught me, or or, uh, not not really. They they're not as financial savvy. I, I think the Americans are a little bit more savvy in that space. Um, the G Germans are a little There's bit a more like for that, though. yeah, s save money, just save it, put it on the bank, get some. Uh, r the bank will handle it, and uh, d don't really. Do it yourself, or or don't don't be don't, don't try to to get, get control over that. The Germans are very security focused. That's why they they hesitate to um, take risks um, in the personal space. I think, and, and I think in general, the European system, sort of being somewhat socialist, mm -hmm. was sort of like we take care of you. So like retirement planning in Europe is completely different focus than the United States because in the United States you don't really get much money. You That's know. True. So if you don't plan for your future, there is not a safety net like you've mm. tried to create in Europe. So I think Europeans feel less need, I think, to take mm -hmm. risk, you know, where Americans kind of have to if you want to have any money. Just the same, I think that's a short-sighted mentality for Europeans. And mm -hmm. it's, it's also hurt European growth because you don't have the same level of investment exactly. in European startups, for example. And there are many great European companies. Um, and so I think there's this opportunity to modernize Europe's investment uh, like thought process from the individual level and also from the governmental level. We're doing business now in Europe through Von Tobel Securities and and just to open up an account if you're European is 50 times harder than if you're American. You know, there's like a thousand rules, there's a thousand jurisdictions. So this is the problem with Europe. It's really hard yeah. to do business if I'm in Germany and like France has completely different rules than Germany. Absolutely. It's ridiculous. Yeah, it's 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 um, pretty interesting because um, um, this risk averseness that the Germans have, um, you could see that in VW as well. These this risk averseness mm -hmm. breaks their neck right now because that's not how you handle disruption. They we have a disruptive technology right now on the rise. Tesla really crushed it and pushed the. I I would say the EV space like 10, 20 years, uh, like just like laser focused just pushed it out there and then they were like oh god we just had diesel gate what what the hell is happening right, right. they're so busy just trying to make the <laughs> yeah, cars live they try to cover everything but, up you know I, I honestly i blame world war ii on this you know mm. like when you look at german history so much innovation was happening in germany in like from the late 1800s during the industrial era so germany was a leader during the industrial era so like 18 like 75 to world war one you know, Germany was like inventing tons of stuff. Like you actually were so far ahead and because of Hitler, so it was like a brain drain and everybody left. 
and they came to America. A yeah. lot of them. Some Absolutely. of them went to Russia. Um, and you look at innovation in America post World War II. It was because so many people came to America, the immigrants, whether they be Jewish, Christian, whatever. It, it was the intellects. It was the people Hitler targeted who were smart. Yeah. Left, and they were smart enough to leave, you know. And so post World War II, I think Germany, similar to Japan, the psyche changed yeah. dramatically from innovation and being an aggressive country to being a very passive country and like security and like we want to play by the rules. And I think now we're starting to see this shift in Germany and Japan now. Hey, we've been worried about this for 70 years now. Maybe it's time we build a military again. Maybe it's time we mm. take more aggressive stance in technology. And maybe it's time we start leading the world a little bit. And Japan and Germany should be leaders in the world. Yeah, um, I also think that um, like in the 70s, around the 70s, the Japanese like flooded the German markets with um, new, uh, like with the cheap um, Japanese cars. They also did that in the US and in the US they were successful, but in Germany they weren't because um, Germany really did a great job or the German car brands to shield their market with their quality. They really like focused on quality control. And um, that's why in the 70s, 80s, around that time period, they really like, uh, That's why you don't really see so the 80s, but like I you couldn't beat yeah, Volkswagen I, I'm not sure. in the late 80s. Yeah. Yeah. No, you couldn't really beat Volkswagen in the late 80s. Yeah. My first car was a Volkswagen in 1987. And they made great cars, yeah. you know. Yeah, exactly. And um, now we are seeing this the shift. They um, in the software space, they lag so much behind. That's why, um, like, they also had a kind of brain drain in 1995 because um, Germany started to regulate all these um, uh, all these technology startups very fast. Right. They're like right at it, and okay, uh, how how can we text these guys uh, like right away? And in, right, and, right. and then they and said they like, okay, let's go to Silicon Valley where we don't have right. uh, restrictions and we can just like this is the hot spot we're gonna leave and yeah, this was also, yeah and that breaks our next uh today too and uh, vw for example uh, but see like even when i think about, like we always talk about investing in europe and and yeah. like i won't buy a european index because i don't want all these companies in the index and then it's like you look at like what are the best companies in europe and you're like well they're robotics you know it's technology sap you know like so you have held yourselves back like Like, it's kind of crazy if you think about how bad the German government has been. Yeah. Like, for the people and yeah. for the potential of what Germany could be. Yeah, that's, that's true. I don't know if the new guy is any better, you know. Uh, but... You, you you have to give them a little bit credit, uh, not not the government, but but the companies in Germany. For example, Goman Automation was the company that right. was bought up by by Tesla. Um, no, it yeah, is yeah, like some, the most yeah. important thing Tesla did was yeah. buy that company. Yeah, but because of and that, was, they could produce their still, yeah the batteries. And the I'm whole uh, forty six eighty battery line is based on the Goman Automation right. uh, machines. Yeah, exactly. Well, it, it's Maxstar and Grumman, but it's the whole robotics yeah. side is Grumman. Of and course. they would not be building anything like they're building without them. And now, like this German plant, boy, <laughs> in a year when you see what they'll be making, because yeah. he's going to take German manufacturing to the next level. Yeah. And the Germans won. But they just haven't had this innovative culture that Tesla really fosters where you can run fast and break stuff, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, they still have to figure out these culture shock difference uh, differences that they have, and and um, I I think because um, in Germany it's like that we have like everything is very like like you said very regulated and also inside of the companies we always have uh, like it's normal for us to have a. Um, a What's it called? I always forget the word. Um, union. We always have unions. Yeah, unions. It's very normal. Lots of holidays. Yeah. yeah. But but if holidays. if Tesla pays more than the union can, uh, than than the average uh, of of engineering jobs, then it's it it will be fine. But um, someday they have to unionize. It's, it, they won't get around that. I think in Germany it's very hard I, to. I, I agree. Unions. Yeah. I agree. I and I think. You know, this is funny because I just met with the president of Polestar and we were talking about oh, marketing, cool. how Europeans, you know, they're, they're Swedes and how Europeans market versus Americans market. Yeah. You know, and like if you want to sell cars in America, you kind of have to be like noisy and loud and like <laughs> make a big splash. People like that. In Europe, you market differently to your consumers and such. But I think one of the issues that European companies face is this lack of boldness of taking risks, of, of being aggressive, of 
You know, exactly what you're saying. Well, they'll have to unionize. You're right. But that will hurt innovation at Tesla. Absolutely. In, in Berlin, because unions have certainly proven that the benefit that they offer is it doesn't offset the cost, you know. And and so ultimately, I don't think companies win through unionization. And nor do I think employees. Win. Yeah. Um, so so I think this is what makes Europe less competitive globally against Asia and the United States. Yeah, totally. And this is something that I think Europe needs to really think about if they want to be competitive with Europe and the United States, mm -hmm. which is capitalism with guardrails will increase the wealth of the average European a lot more than like a conservative unionized business environment. I also agree with that. And so it's just how much wealth do you want to create, you know? Yeah, that's that's true. And um You mentioned Polsa. I want to get into that a little bit because um, I find it fa uh, fascinating. I've I've also talked with um, Lars from Best in Tesla about this topic because he's also very analyzing the Chinese um, competitors of Tesla, for example. And it's very interesting to see that um, ch uh, the, the Chinese companies have the strategy to buy up German uh, or European brands. For example, GM, which is a British brand, or yeah, it was a you 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 must know GM. Yeah, Volvo. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and and um, they really did a great job. And then then they just um, put Chinese technology into that, and then they marketed it to Europe. And uh, the Germans uh, don't, or or the Europeans don't really know. Oh, this is a Chinese brand. No, they they have to disguise. Well, it's not it. a Chinese brand. It's not yeah, a Chinese no, brand. It, it's not exactly. But but I mean um, it's it's uh, Chinese technology in that Chinese sense, yeah. ownership yeah, or ownership and Chinese exactly. supply chain yeah 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 you, yeah exactly we have to specify that that's that's true but well yeah. but I think that's like why this works is because they know that the Europeans can build higher quality vehicles than they can and they know they've got the supply chain the battery tech and the manufacturing ability exactly. So, That's why I like Pulsar actually, because exactly, huh? the Europeans are great at making great vehicles, and and the Chinese are are getting real good at the technology. And it's a great mix. Yeah, that's that's true. Maybe we can just jump into uh, w while we're talking about Tesla and everything. Then I'm gonna um, take that question a little bit further here, and we're gonna talk about Twitter after after this yeah. <laughs> after this segment. I'd rather talk about cars than Twitter. Yeah, I know, I know, but we have to get through this I because love cars. Yeah, I know. I hate me too. social media. Yeah, so, I know. Yeah. <laughs> I know what you mean. Uh, but we have to get through this one more time, Ross. No, I know no, you're no, fed no, up no, with I'll that do topic. It. I'll do it for you. I'll do it for you. Okay, thank you very much. But but um. What do you think about the implications that the Tesla Semi has? I mean, we've seen the numbers, we, we've seen um, some testings now on the road, and uh, it's astonishing to me that they really kept what they said. I mean, I, mean, I didn't um, hesitate to believe that, but um, it's interesting to see it now on the road because the um, one of the Mercedes um, CEOs, I'm, I'm not sure who it was, but he said that this is a uh, physical in the physical space impossible to do and here right. we are <laughs> yeah. right. well we've heard this about probably every great innovation yeah. in history it was impossible before it was done so i think elon actually really likes when people say it's impossible you know um when you look at the technology that they put into the semi like i was reading last night about like how big is this battery how are they able to tow you know eighty thousand pounds on 500 miles uphill you know or whatever And it looks to be this massive battery pack that they're building for the semi. And it costs about $100,000, they're guessing, for this battery. And if they can sell the truck for $150,000 to $200,000, that's like within range of class, I think, what are they, class A or B vehicles. So I live in California, and California is like kind of the agricultural like heart of a, a, a lot of America. And so when you leave L.A. and you drive north, you basically get farmland, and you have what we call a grapevine The five freeway, and every day from a five freeway, there's literally lines of semi trucks going north and south, delivering food mostly uh, all over the world. You know, mostly here in California, but also throughout the United States. And whenever I drive the five, I'm always like, "Oh my god, there are so many semi trucks just in a line driving every day." A lot of it is actually to transport oil too, by the way. And then you are look at the pollution. So every truck is like, I think they were saying is like 20 times worse than a car. Okay. So it's not as big a market as cars, but the amount that they drive in the pollution is enormous and they're critically important in the transportation sector or industry. So when you think about 
from the perspective that Tesla has mastered self-driving on the highways. What they're trying to master now is on the streets. But most truck drivers are only on the highways. Mm -hmm. And when you drive in this country, it's basically like one or two lanes and you just go straight. So autopilot works real easily on these type of rides. So now I can get in my truck, charge 500 miles, drive to my next spot, and basically sit there and enjoy the view. Okay? It's going to change trucking. It's exactly. going to change trucking. So the issue isn't whether it will change trucking. The issue is how many can they build? Yeah. And I'm tweeting Elon. I go, how many are you going to build? He's like, I'm at Twitter firing people right now. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? And I'm like, dude, how many trucks are you going to build? Because I think they sell every one of them and they sell them for 200 grand. And if they can build, you know, I don't know, 50,000 a year, you've got a great business. Yeah, that's true. I'm, and especially with with um, the um, artificial intelligence that they that they use and um, with their uh, uh, Dojo computer and the training, I think um, they're gonna have a huge advantage with the trains, especially with the tra uh, tra if the trailers are behind um, like multiple yeah, trucks. Yeah, uh, what do they call that? Uh, pontooning or something? Where all the trucks platooning, drive platooning. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, but that's already happening with gas trucks, right? Yeah, you already yeah, they do it. Yeah. This. Better aerodynamics, anyways, for all the other truckers. Exactly. That's what I'm saying. You already see them doing this. And now I just have this vision of it all being electric trucks, all autonomous. And now you're talking about safety. So many years ago, I had an employee I, who was at my company, and his son was driving home from Vegas, and a truck driver fell asleep and slammed into their car oh, and no. it killed three of his friends. And he was severely injured. And fortunately, he ended up being okay. But he was permanently changed as a person from of this course. experience. And it was potentially for this family, an enormous tragedy. And it was very fortunate that the kid was okay. But it was basically a truck driver who fell asleep. And this happens all the time. It's an exhausting job. You're on the road and yep. you just doze off and boom, it's a massive accident and deaths and injuries and all that are because these are big trucks. Yep. So you in You add a level of safety, you add efficiency, you lower cost. And this is what Tesla has done in changing the transportation sector because there would be no reason for any company not to buy these. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Especially and, with the and safety. That's, that's the next stage for them. Yeah, I also see that. Um, if you compare it with the European trucks, you know how they look, right? <laughs> the, I yeah. mean, this this walls that just driving aerodynamics uh, of a brick wall. I don't know <laughs> how, how this is a good idea, but um, yeah, this is an, a design that that was is very popular in Europe. I don't know really yeah. why they did it. I think it's cost savings or something. I don't really know why, but. Um, Or they just didn't care about aerodynamics. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, maybe. Uh, but but yeah, that's and the Mer Mercedes uh, uh, um, electric truck that they put out or or planning to put out is really also the this brick wall. And I'm I'm thinking right, why don't you redesign it? I don't really get it. Um, if you compare the aerodynamics of the Tesla Semi, for example, and the Mercedes, then right. yeah, why why should? But it's it? also like when you build an electric car, yeah. like aerodynamics are a huge element because your range is 100 affected by that. So. But I also think a lot of people are like sort of caught up with like what a truck should look like, yeah. or what a car should look like. That's like, and then he comes out with a cyber truck and everybody's like, oh my God, you know, I don't think Elon's caught up on what a truck should look like. He's like, how did I make the best truck ever? Yeah. You know, and the truck looks cool, yeah. by the way, too. But I, I mean, when you look at the materials of the actual outside of the truck, it's like, it weighs almost nothing and they've stripped this thing down. So like, it's genius. It's just genius. And and I think the people who are selling Tesla stock today or, or all week, because Elon isn't focused on Tesla, are literally like missing a huge forest over a leaf. Yeah. You know? And I think that's the part that blows my mind. It's exactly like 2019 where everything's going right for Tesla, but the market's acting like everything's going wrong. Yeah, we, we've seen that a lot. It's it's really crazy. I, I And right now, I mean, you see, do you think it's also a macro thing? How do you see the macro in 2023? Because um, with the market development and we see inflation going up right now, and if employ uh, unemployment is on the rise, then a recession will be um, declared. And if so, do you think the S&P will bottom afterwards like we saw in the past? You know what I mean? Like the when the recession... I think, I think we're in a period of time like I've never seen. Okay. okay. So you have... America is booming. America is booming. Mm -hmm. People all have jobs. People are spending money. People are out. They're buying stuff. And the Fed doesn't like it. 
Fed, everybody's getting raises. Everybody's getting rich. And the Fed's like, we can't have that. We got to stop that. Okay. So there's inflation because a war broke out and mm -hmm. energy spiked. Yeah. Okay. Now that, that's done. The energy's back down. Okay. $72 a barrel a day. If anything, the energy guys are worried it's going lower because of China, right? So we've got China recession, you got Europe in a recession, you got rates going through the roof. And if the Fed doesn't change their tack, we're going to be in a recession too. But that said, the US economy is as strong as I've ever seen it. People's desire to spend money is like I've never seen it. This is great news. This whole expectation that we're going to have some sort of recession that could be very bad is incorrect because all the Fed has to do is lower rates and there's a ton of money that would come back into the economy. So like right now, like I was just in a meeting before this with a real estate company that's a client of mine and they have all this capital. And instead of investing in real estate because they just can't right now because it's all going down mm -hmm. and rates are so high, they're just going to be bonds. And we're earning a higher return on the bonds than on government bonds than we do on the properties. So what's going to happen to real estate? So if I'm only getting a four or five percent cap rate on real estate, but I can get the same four or five percent guarantee by the government, real estate's the next shoe to go down. So like I don't understand the point of this from the Fed. So they've sopped up all this money, inflation's gone, and you know. So will this hurt Tesla next year? No, because if you're worried about inflation, you buy an electric vehicle. That's your cost of living. I literally have no inflation in my life. The only inflation has been labor, like, mm -hmm. you know, the people who work at my home or or such char are charging more, which is fine. They deserve more. It's okay. Hey, they haven't made a lot of money for a long time. So wage growth is not a bad thing. Okay. And then, you know, there's some food cost increase. No question. You go out to the restaurants, it's more expensive, you know, but you don't have to do that. Yeah. You need it at home. Yeah, it's a little bit more expensive. It is. But you're also making five, 10% more with like the average employee. So when you look at the way CPI is calculated, it actually reflects no real person's cost of living. It's just an arbitrary number compared to an arbitrary number. Like I was reading that the rent component of CPI is something like 40% of the core rate of inflation. But I'm like, rent is not 40% of people's like bills. You know, it's more like 25 to 30. So it's like rent has a higher weighting in CPI than it actually is in real life. So CPI has no reflection. So the Fed is basically raising rates based off a number that has no reflection on real life. None of them actually have real jobs or even know what's happening in real life or have ever had a real job. They're all academics. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And so we're being run by the... The, the 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 academically smart people who are really dumb in real life, and um, and so that will be reversed next year, and we'll be fine. Everything will be fine. China is going to open up next year. The war is going to end. Everything is going to be fine in twenty three. This negativity is an opportunity. Yeah, I also see that this way. I'm I'm also again no financial advice. I have to put it out there, but I'm I'm scooping up every every penny I have to just uh, like. Get the time. I'm not really timing the market. I'm just looking at it, and and I'm still um, very bullish on Tesla still, because the fundamentals haven't changed. I, I, that's something I've discussed the last uh, how about like six, seven episodes. It's very crazy because the fundamentals have not changed. No, they've gotten better. Yeah, the fundamentals have gotten better. They've gotten better. Absolutely. And that's crazy. This is exactly how I got super rich five years ago. Because I'm already doing okay. And, and Tesla is going through this period of time. So 2018, they had all these production problems. And I was like, oh, shit, we're going to go BK. We can't get Model 3 up. In 2019, we had Model 3 up. And then the short sellers attacked. <laughs> so I was like, what? Like, we're making the cars. It's working. So I fly up to Tesla, just to double check. You know, okay. I walk the production line. I, I spend the whole day there. And I come back and I go, what the heck? Yeah. This company's kicking butt. And the market's acting like they're failing. Okay. So I bought a lot more Tesla. This was ironically at the same exact price Tesla is today, pre split. Okay. It was like 175 at the low in 2019. And we bought and we bought. And it was like 
oh God, this is painful, but I got to do it. Yeah. Okay. Because the fundamentals just like, you can't be emotional. No. It's just the valuation makes no sense here for the growth. Rate. Simple. Okay. Don't think about it. Don't be emotional. Right. So, so then what happened was it's all about sentiment. The reason why Tesla stock is down, A, Elon sold a bunch of stock to buy Twitter, which put pressure on the stock and changed the sentiment. And then Elon takes over Twitter as CEO and it absolutely changes the sentiment negative towards Elon. And institutional investors are like, oh, you know, do we really want to invest in Tesla when he's spending all his time doing something else? And so many have sold. And so what happened is you have PE compression. There's nothing wrong with Tesla. It went from 100 times earnings, which is saying you're the best company in the world and everybody loves you and you're growing like crazy and everything's perfect, to now it's trading at 25 times forward earnings. Okay. And they're supposed to grow 50% in earnings this year. Exactly. That's like every year. Insane like discount. Every year. Yeah. Yeah. But I'm saying in the next 12 months, their earnings should grow at least 50%. Yeah. And you got a 25 PE. So that's a 0.5, what we call peg ratio. This is how I invest. Okay. If the peg ratio is below one, so if your growth rate is bigger than your PE, mm -hmm. and these numbers are likely to happen, it is presents a great opportunity for investors. Yeah. And it doesn't matter what the stock is. It's just if your growth rate is this and your PE is this, you have a disconnect. And that's what you have in Tesla. So Tesla could double in value and then it would get back to its to the correct valuation with about $350 a share in my mind. Exactly. And if, if I mean, I've I've analyzed the German market and I'm very um, interested in the competition because when you I have to quote this even in the put it in quotes, the competition, because it's so ridiculous what's happening there. I mean, they are publicly admitting right now more or less that they like at first they don't want to target the mass market anymore. I mean, this was pre prevalent before. Um, Mercedes never wanted to, to uh, because it was already declining. This this um, mass market with their A M series of cars, for example, and and uh, stuff like that. So so they just scrapped it. BMW says, okay, no mass market, nothing. And now you see the last competitor in Germany, VW, that that could tackle mass production, actually can't tackle mass production they they i mean they say they want to produce around five million electric vehicles uh 2030 tesla wants to produce let's just say 10 million let's just say 10 million not 20 like elon said like uh, you can cut that in half but still i mean that would be the size of uh, vw today and toyota for example which is crazy even if they can produce 10 million cars um i think it's li like you already see it's like They're gonna have the luxury luxury segment, but I think what they oversee is that they are so bad in software, and if they don't step up their game at software, then their car, even if they have leather stitching, is not luxurious in the in the haptics, how you how you use the car. It's I I don't really know. Maybe maybe just collectors. I I don't really know who wants so to the buy this car. Software element is still a big problem for the competitors. Yeah, absolutely. You know, they still mm. like, and I work with these. Uh, I, I mean, I, I don't like to call them competitors to Tesla because I think anybody who builds an EV will sell an EV. Yeah, so absolutely. it's not That's EVs true. against each other. So like the way yeah. I see it is it's EVs versus ICE. Yeah. So the, the competitor to EV is ICE. Okay. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't matter. You're making EVs. You're going to sell your EV if it's at all good. That's like true. people don't want to pay for gas. Okay. So That's like, true. so when you think about, I don't know if you've ever been to an electric car factory before. But if no. you watch an electric car get built, it's very different than a regular car, okay? So the way a regular car works is it kind of has this like whole engine and then this whole like axle and like infrastructure to transfer the power from the, from the motor to the wheels. And it's like this very complicated thing when you open up the hood. Like when you open up the hood of a car, there's a lot to it, okay? And there's valves and there's tubes and there's all this stuff a belts it's such a mechanical process that it seems crazy that in a hundred years they haven't done this better right absolutely mm. so when you build a car you have it's like building legos you create a production line where everybody got put their piece of lego in and at the end you got your car but when you build an electric car it's completely different 
It's completely different. And this is what's screwing up all these cars. Yeah. It's like building an iPhone, but it has wheels and it has to have durability. So when you build an iPhone and you go to the Foxconn factory, you see a completely different thing than an auto manufacturing facility. Now, so now imagine building an iPhone that's as big as a car. So you don't actually change the manufacturing process from the Foxconn perspective. You just have to make it bigger. But what matters the most when you're building a phone? The chips and the batteries and the software. Because the actual case of your iPhone, the case is okay. The screen, that was a big deal at first, but we mastered that. Okay, so why did I buy a new iPhone then? Because it's what's inside, a better battery and a better chip, right? And so like, what matters when you're building EVs is how many great batteries can I build? Do I have a, a hardware infrastructure that will run it and a software ability to make it work consistently? Like one of the things nobody ever talks about is how Tesla cars have never been hacked and shut down. Like we've never had a day where it was like Tesla got hacked and all Tesla cars just didn't work. Like they can do that in theory, right? Because it's all connected. So they could like mess up like its connection and then all the Tesla cars wouldn't know what to do, you know? But it's never happened. And it gives you an idea of how much time and effort has been put into software and how much time and effort has been put in to building an incredible architecture and infrastructure around the communication and connection of the vehicles. So the actual car part is not that hard. <laughs> you know, you slap on a few wheels and, and you're done. You stamp out the thing and, and that's the difference. And that's why the other car companies are so far behind is because they're still making cars. They're not making phones with wheels. And, and but, but this part is also so crazy. Even in manufacturing of the electric car, I mean, uh, the Model 3 is built three times faster than the ID3, yeah, for example. No yeah. Have you ever seen it? There's no parts. <laughs> yeah. It's like you stamp up the car, yeah. you slap on the wheels, and you're done. Yeah. You know, it's like, it's like the hard part is the battery. Yeah. And you the know? battery management the and software. Is yeah. Batteries and scale and, and motors, you know, like the yeah. most people don't understand that the, the Tesla motors and the wheels uses a, a type of magnet technology that nobody else has. And that's why Teslas are so fast and get such an efficiency with range is because of actually the motors and the wheels. And most people don't know this. So when you're looking at how you make a car compete with Tesla, You got to have a technological base in battery production and skill set and motor production and skill set that no other company has. So that is a moat that's pretty deep for Tesla when you look at battery and, and, and technology infrastructure. Um, so when you look at building cars like I'm building phones with wheels, it's a totally different mental process than I'm building cars with great tech. Yeah, absolutely. And I also think that if you compare it again to to the German car companies, their whole R&D, their research and development is really in the internal combustion engine. And they really did a right. great job perfecting that. I mean, the German car brands have like crazy patents on, on everything. Um, like also in the sports sector, for example, you can't really beat a German or, or yeah, you can. I mean, we have the Italian brands as well, of course, but um, some of them are even owned by German car makers. And um, if, you, if you look at that, um, I get why they don't want to change technology because they have their whole supply chain in that direction. But now we well, see this yeah. trend. Yeah. And and uh, hydrogen, that's why they are drooling over hydrogen and e-fuel so much because they, they say, ah, oh, come on, please, we we can't shift this fast. And, and now um, when VW announced that they kick out um, um, Herbert Dies, Or no, he 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 just uh, stepped back, of course. <laughs> and right. yeah, Step but back. but but now they have uh, Blume, and um, I'm a little bit hesitant because Blume is really a fan of e-fuels, and if they now change course again, they're gonna st again have 10 years delay with putting out a great electric vehicle, and then the game is over. It's over. And uh, this has huge implications for the German market be because guess what? All Many jobs in Germany are reliant on the um, on the car industry here, of course, because we built That's that huge. up over 100 years. It's a huge sector in Germany. And also the small and medium enterprises that are connected, the, the suppliers. Um, I think that, that Tesla will have a phase in Germany where they can just cherry pick. 
really cherry pick the best because we have highly specialized companies here that are, are doing it right now. Yeah, they're already doing that. And um, if I don't know if you heard that EBM Pops just um, they make turbines for um, for the motor uh, for BMW, and they just canceled their. Uh, they just said uh, we're going to cancel the contracts. We're going to. Uh, go to server infrastructure to cool servers now and just go away from the internal combustion engine they they uh, are doing the turbines for the for the um for the cooling and that's an impl that's something that that's now it's the first domino that's that's falling and uh, i think we're going to see more of that in the next years uh, but i think it's very normal yeah for very maybe. large successful businesses to not want to change you know like yeah. like in some cases, people don't want companies to change. Like when you think about like the new Coke, you know, it of didn't course. do well. Yeah. <laughs> I like my Coke the way it was and they changed it and nobody wanted it. So there's that element. So, you know, you create new brands, for example, or you go into water or whatever. What I think, unfortunately, and I see this at a lot of big companies, so I, I can't say, oh, this is just a German issue. This is actually a big company issue is that if you go into a CEO's office and you say everything the way you're doing it is going to change. And the way it's going to change will put you out of business in 10 years. But what you're going to have to do is going to hurt earnings over the next six months, maybe a year. Okay. So you got to go out to the street and explain this story that in 10 years is the smartest move you'll ever make. But right now, we're going to eat crow for a year, like Twitter, you know? And so it's like the CEO is like, listen, I get paid on two to three year performance. Like I make 20 million a year. Like, why would I shake up this Apple car? Like, what what do I gain personally? It's not even my company. I get paid $20 million a year. I sell ice engines and or I sell, you know, transportation service for motors. And and it's like, I don't want anything to change. I don't I want to, I'm gonna put in legislation to prevent these changes so I can keep making money as long as possible, as long as possible. And see, the problem with that is it doesn't work. Because innovation will happen, and then you leave yourself behind, and then instead of in 10 years you succeeding, in five years you end up like General Electric. So when you look at General Electric today, when you look at Boeing today, they're garbage companies. Their innovation died. They basically like became these like boring industrial companies that just want to sell basically planes that they didn't even really test correctly. Okay, the management is 100% to blame for the problems at Boeing. And it's like, and they all still just get paid, you know, 20 million a year, 20 million a year, 20 million a year. And, and, and that's why people like Elon Musk take over companies, fire everybody, and take the good part and rebuild it because that's what needs to be done. Okay. And, and so then companies have all these protections against that happening. You know, like anti-takeover positions, antitrust, you know, like the Microsoft Activision deal, which there's just no reason to stop this deal. Activision was such a poorly managed company. It's a great asset. Microsoft will do great with it. It's not anti-competitive in any way. And the government's like this and the government, well, why? And it's just all about kind of trying to keep the status quo for the people so there's not more competition for other players. Mm. Yeah. So... Capitalism works really well, and they, what they try to do is put in all these barriers against capitalistic nature so that everybody can keep the status quo, keep collecting their money, build another Nord Stream, collect more Russian money, like pay off more government officials in Germany so that Germany can just be completely reliant on oil and gas from Russia for ever. That was the plan. Yeah, that's okay. that's sad. Yeah, that's very sad. So this is the best pain that Germany will ever feel this year. Mm. The pain that Germany is going through this next six months will make Germany a thousand times better country in five years. Thank God. Yeah. Because if that Nord Stream <laughs> would have come in and Putin didn't invade Ukraine and you go out five years, you're just a vassal state to Russia, basically. Yeah, and um, but now, it, yeah. Germany can adjust. Go all in on clean energy, get off this oil and gas yeah. from Russia, and be a leader in clean energy in Europe. The economy will take off. We become allies again. We unite against Chinese oppression and Russian oppression, and the West wins. Mm. Yeah, it's, so it's bigger yeah. than the corporate side. It's political in regaining our power back 
Europe and the United States in the world so that we're not dependent on oil producing nations yeah. so that we have to do whatever they say, Saudi Arabia. Yeah. Honestly, it's embarrassing to yeah. me yeah. as an American. The wars we fought, the, 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 the pain this country has gone through to become a great nation and that we have to kowtow to Saudi Arabia, mm. that is wrong. Now we're going to Venezuela and we're doing deals with drug dealers in Madeira just to get more oil while he oppresses his people. And Chevron's perfectly happy to go do it. Mm. I'm like, why, why is Biden doing this? Yeah, the, the oil business is a very dirty business. It's really like that. And and uh, in Germany, uh, the case, I mean, I was witnessing it firsthand. Um, they had a plan to uh, get a deep sea cable from Norway directly to Germany. And they scrapped the plans because the German lobby of, of energy, the energy um, lobby here said just, nah, we got, want to sell our own uh, electricity. We don't want to buy electricity from our neighbor who has huge overhead, in, yeah. huge overhead. And they could power like more than half of Germany or, or even like the whole. No I, problem. Yeah. Well, it turns out Germany could actually get tons of gas from Qatar. Yeah. So I, I, this summer, my neighbor was a Qatari. And his whole family's there, and we're talking. You know, in a, in LA, you got everybody from every of course, yeah, background. So you know, like it, Berlin, I yeah. like, yeah, and and I like you know meeting different people. So we're kind of become friendly, me and this Qatari guy, and and we start. And I and I thought Qatar for some reason had more oil than gas. He goes, no, we have gas, mm. and we're making a fortune, and we couldn't be happier that everybody's shutting off Russia because it's all going to Qatar. So Qatar does this deal with Germany and just fills you up with natural gas. And it turns out we have tons of natural gas too, you know, in America. And now prices are dropping because everybody's like focused on solving this problem, right? And we don't need Russian oil and gas. We don't need any of it. So we embargo Russian oil, prices is still going down. It's unbelievable. We put the price cap in on Russia, price is still going down. Russia can only sell to China now, and China doesn't need that much oil. Mm. Yeah, so now they're putting oil on boats in Russia again, just hoping to sell it in the future. Yeah, yeah. This war is going to end, and we're going to win. Hopefully, I, I really hope so because uh, it's very near the German border, of course. So, so people, mm. I mean, they're not really scared of that. Um, but, but you could feel an uneasiness in in many people. Like they're like, ah, uh, I mean, it's not a great story. To well, clearly, the Russian army has nothing to be scared of. Okay, okay? the Russian army. Is an embarrassment to military forces in the world, and we know how the German army operates and a level of professionalism and competency that we would destroy Russia. Uh, like, I think this was a very illuminating thing to see. So, you know, Germany now can take steps to protect itself more, and at the same respect, I think this neuters Russia well into the future. They basically will be destroyed by the time they're done with this war. So, so I think Europe has a lot to worry about from a nuclear perspective because clearly the risks are very high of an accident uh, or a misstep. But when you're talking about NATO and the future of Europe, I think it's never looked brighter now. Mm. I think it's never looked brighter. Yeah, I also hope that the that this conflict will resolve next year. Hopefully, um, it will resolve next year. Yeah, I'm, I have no doubt. Like. Combat operations are extremely difficult and expensive. Yeah. In America, we've done this for 20 years. And when you see the drain on your society, and even wars that you're not really, like in Afghanistan, we didn't even really leave the bases for 10 years. You know, it's just like, mm. we're there. It costs billions and billions, and we support operations, but we didn't do much, you know? Mm. But when you're fighting every day, every day, with these very expensive weapons, and, not, and I'm not even talking human costs, Russia just cannot do this for much longer, especially when uh, when uh, when oil prices drop. Uh, yeah. yeah, because it's um, Russia um, invaded Crimea in the first place because um, the oil price was so high and they had so much uh, uh, they had so yeah, much reserves. They pay for it. Yeah, they could yeah. pay it. Yeah, and that was the that was the calculation with Ukraine. Yeah, was that they paid for the war from the oil spike. And that's how they were paying for the war at first. Yeah. And, and they just miscalculated a lot of things. Mm. They thought this would be short. They thought, you know, the five days push back. They thought everything they thought was wrong. Yeah. Yeah. Crazy. You know? So that said, it's a chance for us to destroy Russia. And that's what's happening right now. I mean, the Russians are real dumb to continue to fight. That's the way I look at it. Mm. 
Okay. Yeah. They need to go back to the old borders and pray that they'll negotiate and let them keep Crimea. That's that's where Russia should be. And that's what they'll get to. By the time winter's done, it'll churn through their troops like I also think we we're gonna see like like this huge shift in in the energy sector, and um, you just have to look at it. Uh, which company is set up the way for the future? I mean, it is Tesla. They have energy storage. They have if they if they really like get more lithium as much as they can, and they really did a great job to secure lithium uh, for the next like ten, fifteen, twenty years, and with. And they have such a huge buying power also. I mean, they have so much money in the war chest. They are not, they don't have really uh, like like liabilities with banks. They they really have uh, like they're- Yeah, they have no debt. Yeah, no debt. They are in the in a pole position to like dominate the next 20, 30 years in the, even in the energy sector. And if we are, I mean, the car sector is cute in comparison to the energy sector. Like really, that's right. Yeah, and that it, is right. And with smart grids and everything, you can see that in smaller communities or even in cities. I, it here. Pff, wow. I mean, especially in the U.S., we have uh, you have a very um, much suburbs uh, style um, housings and stuff like that. In Germany, we don't have space. It's a little bit more difficult because, like in private um, ownership, there is only like forty percent of all, uh, like like all houses. Right. Here. Yeah, it's very. Well, small. also, you're, it's not as sunny in Germany, too. You know, like we have <laughs> okay, large yeah, areas true. of our country that are quite warm and easy for solar, you know, like real easy for solar. Yeah. In fact, it's too warm too, in most too easy the country. For solar, yeah. So solar is real easy in America because we've got space and yeah. sun, you know, where in Germany, obviously, it's a much more dense population and different weather patterns. Um, but just the same, even if you're not 100% solar, uh, there's other alternative energies like nuclear that Germany used to be a leader in and is not per se is profitable, but certainly a great source of energy, you know, and I think people need to start really thinking about that from a governmental perspective. But when you talk about Tesla in the future, you know, there was a Tesla investor who was emailing me yesterday who is super worried because the stock's down mm, and oh yeah. my God, and Elon's at Twitter and this and that. And I said, you know, Why do you care? All that matters is the business. Okay. The stock will come back if the business succeeds. Okay. And the business is succeeding. But you mentioned something just now, which I think is the most impactful thing that the people listening to this podcast can think about is that we are at the beginning, not the middle, the beginning of a massive shift in the way that we use energy. It's not about cars. You're right. The EVs are just an outgrowth of the transportation part of this change, okay? But this is way bigger. It's way bigger because when you go back to 1850, that was when like the steam engine came around and it changed like commerce and transportation when we had steam engines and trains. And the train, like if you study the history of trains, like in America, for example, it was, it changed everything because Like getting on a wagon train and going west was like almost a death sentence, you know, and it was just like a nightmare in commerce and trade. And once we built these railroads, the people who built the railroads were the richest people in America because they controlled energy and transportation. And then communication because they laid the telegraph lines next to the rail lines. Energy, transportation and communication. What the hell do you think Elon just did? transportation and communication twitter and tesla he's doing more rockefeller day and that's all you have to do is think about the future you're a young guy you're a young person you don't even have to be that young because people are living in 90 anyways and you say in the next decade the entire globe will shift from an oil-based transportation and energy system oil and gas to a renewable energy and transportation system. And I want to invest in everybody involved with this that will do this properly. And that's what I'm doing, okay? So in 10 years, we do another podcast. You got a million followers and you're the big <laughs> guy in Germany as you, as you were doing this right and giving people good information 10 years ago, right? Mm. That's how I got on social media. Yeah. Okay, so I've been doing it 10 years, you know, yeah. on Twitter or whatever. And if you give people good information for 10 years, you'll be big. Yeah. But if the Germans pay attention to this and invest in this, you'll make a lot of people wealthy because we're going to switch to this and Europe's going to be a leader in switching to this because you guys have always paid four times more for gas anyways, okay? And 
And when this happens, uh, and it's going to take longer than 10 years, probably 20, but in 10 years, we'll see such a major shift in this. Oil, right? Oil will just be like, you'll pay costs for it, essentially. And like, it'll still be used. It will not be a growing investment industry in any way, a shrinking industry. And we'll still use oil, obviously, because there'll be many areas that will take a lot of time to switch over. Yeah. But but the growth will be dramatic when you get into the second half of like 2025 to 2030, because that's when all the capacity for battery comes online, yeah. really. And that's when we can start making 20 and 30 million cars a year and trucks and, and really impact. But when you think about I could invest in Ford in like 1900. Yeah. Yeah. That's what you're doing right now when you buy Tesla. Yeah, that's true. And so investors should not be concerned at all. Don't be worried. This is a temporary time where the market sucks and you can pick up all these great energy companies and solar. My fund has a, a good exposure to them. We have solar, we have commodities like lithium and such. And then we've got all the EV players and that's the future. That is the most obvious trend. I've done this for three decades. I saw computers coming, I saw the cell phones coming and now I see the EVs coming and I have not been wrong over my life on these macro trends. You know, sometimes I'm wrong about who wins or loses, but. But this macro trend, I'm as sure about of anything in my career. Mm. And I think investors will be very well served to invest in this energy yeah. and transportation, you know, revolution, basically. Yeah, that's that's totally true. But and the best part yeah. is if we don't do it, we're all going to die anyway. So yeah. we have no choice. Mm. So think about an investment thesis that revolves around if you don't do it, we're all going to die. Mm. <laughs> That's a that's a big uh, motivational factor, I would say. It would seem that you would want to invest in clean energy and transportation. Yeah. It would seem extinction. Humans don't think extinction is possible because we have a false, uh, I would say, assumption of our competency. But dinosaurs thought they were pretty competent too mm. until they were gone. Yeah. Yeah. So we don't want to end up that way. And I think we're smart enough not to end up that way. And we have the solution not to end up that way. And that's what's going to happen. Yeah, I, I, I find it interesting. The, the apocalyptic uh, spin now uh, is the perfect transition. To well, this is a reality. Yeah, yeah a, I, I know. Mean, the tires are, are gnarly. The weather's gnarly all over the world now. You yeah. Know? I'm talking about your Australian friends about the fires. You know yeah, of I mean? course. Yeah, I know. I know the weather. Weather's getting extremer. Um, I, I don't want to make it too lighthearted. I just wanted to to transition to the next uh, topic more yeah. or less. Apocalyptic destruction is is a little. Yeah, I mean, Elon's building spaceships to go to Mars. That's how concerned yeah. he is. Yeah, 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 yeah. But I'm uh, not that. Concerned. Yeah, yeah. But um, I, I just wanted to ask you because I had a he very heated discussion with Farzad Mesbahi on my latest pod, uh, like two two podcasts ago, and uh, because I was, I'm, I'm not sure if if if. Uh, Elon is capable really of of uh, sw switching Twitter to to the everything app because there are factors in place there are factors in place that I'm I'm from the media business as well I'm I'm from that side and and that's my media background and uh, developing apps is very complex it's it's not as yeah I I get that Elon is very talented in in running companies and I have no like I I know uh, from technical standpoint he will crush it but uh, the human factor the human engineering factor that goes into that i think you really I'm, i'm more in your camp that you say we need someone who is specialized more in the media space i, I really am media company. yeah and that's why i wanted to reach out to you and talk to you because of that topic because uh, th th did your uh, opinion change on on elon uh, running twitter now w w when you saw that maybe yeah he, he tries to implement something and it, it seems to from a technical standpoint it seems to get to a place, but uh, how do you analyze the situation? I know you're a little bit tired of this topic, but please. No, I mean, look, so my experience with Twitter is different than most being somebody who's used it for a long time and, and a big person on Twitter. And I've had several incidences where I've been attacked mercilessly on Twitter, like during the Trump period of time when I was anti-Trump. And I went through some pretty bad experiences on Twitter, uh, being attacked by bots, being attacked by uh, forces. And basically one of the things I learned during the election of uh, 2016 was how manipulated Twitter was and how 
so much misinformation was happening on Twitter that basically it was a joke. Uh, it was a joke. You know, it was just a manipulated platform. And that was also what was happening with Facebook. And it was having yeah. a dramatic effect on people's perceptions. And it led to the rise of Donald Trump. So I have no doubt in my mind that if you're wondering the big right turn that we all had to deal with for four years wasn't a Russian plot to destroy our democracies. You're wrong. It was. OK. And that's more than been proven now. And so manipulating social media has been a key tool that our enemies have used against us. And TikTok is the latest venture from our enemies to destroy our children's brains and to track everything we do. Now, I was just doing a live stream on TikTok for the first time, and I started talking critically about China, and our TikTok got turned off, and we've been suspended for a week. When I get back on, which is today, Next week, I am doing an anti-Chinese TikTok live stream, and we will be filming it on YouTube to see how long it'll last before I get taken down. Great idea. Wow. Okay. It's going to be real fun. Yeah. It's going to be real fun. I can't wait. And I'm going to send it to my senators, and I want TikTok banned. I want it banned. It's, it's just another Chinese manipulation of our society. Facebook and Twitter have done enough. So Elon comes in because he's also a big user of Twitter, and he sees this as a critically important issue for the protection of free speech and communication throughout the world. And I agree. It's critically important that a platform like Twitter remain unmanipulated as much as possible, and it's super manipulated now. But I'm like, why would you want to do this? You know, like, why would you want to do this task? It's like being Jesus Christ, okay? And so now he's being crucified for trying to fix something that was widely broken. And he's even presented plenty of evidence, which we all actually knew, that it's wildly broken. And I actually believe he really wants to fix it. The problem is he's not the best person to do things like this. This is no fun. This isn't an engineering solution. This is a very nuanced media and political issue that he is not suited for. And he's proven that. Media owners should not be putting their opinions on political events on their platforms. Rupert Murdoch is a right winger. He owns half the papers. But he does not write letters to the editor in the Wall Street Journal about electing a Republican. Because he already knows he's manipulating the news through the Wall Street Journal. He doesn't need to do that. Elon doesn't even get these things. So he goes out and types, well, it'd be great if the Republicans win the House. And, the, and it's just like, boom, everybody hates him. And I don't think he gets this. Because everybody around him loves him because he's the richest man in the world and gives him all jobs and, and he's so cool. But like... A lot, those aren't from Bloomberg today, and it's true, a lot of Elon supporters hate him right now. Not me, because I think people are entitled to have opinions I don't agree with, and if he wants to torture himself at Twitter for another couple months, trust me, he will be back at Tesla. Okay? If you think what he's doing is fun in any way, and I don't think he even wanted to do it. That's why he was trying to back out of the deal. So ideally, he'll find somebody to run Twitter who has these skill sets as soon as possible, and he'll focus on the engineering part, which I'm sure he'll do a great job with, and Twitter will be a great product. Even the improvement to spaces that they just put up this week was great. Yeah, I think he's going to do a great job on that side of the business. But yeah. I think, not that I would want to run it, but I would be much more suited to dealing with advertisers, media, and entertainers. Yeah. I do this every day. Like I deal with the touchy-feely people every day. See, I have this weird job where I manage money for lots of touchy-feely people and I manage money for lots of concerned people. So I I deal with all of them. And I actually, my belief system is extremely liberal. And many people don't know that. But I don't not like somebody if they're conservative. You know, it's like, I don't care. You know, as long as you're not racist, I don't care. You know, like, so like, I have lots of friends who are conservative Republicans and I have lots of friends who are really liberal, you know, like really liberal. And I don't think Elon does. I don't think he has lots of friends who are really liberal. I just don't. I think he. I think Grimes was the closest thing he had, and now that's gone. 
And now he just hangs out in Texas with a bunch of conservatives. And that's not helping. It's not helping. Yeah, it's pretty difficult to to get people on a social media app at first. I, I mean, new users. Yeah. I, okay, you, you could argue uh, Elon taking over Twitter was a boost of users. You could see that. But um, I, I believe if, if he wants really to get critical mass to build the everything app, there is the problem. Because just because you have great features doesn't mean that people will just use it. Uh, there is so much um, going into the the um, decision to maybe they don't like Elon, for example. And now he's personally connected to Twitter and that's why maybe they are hesitant to install the app. Or do I trust Elon Musk with payments? I mean, he did PayPal, but but you know what I mean? If 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 you have a personal feud with him, Why, why should I think the that? everything app idea is not going to actually happen? Okay. You know, and and I don't look at it that way. I know what the business plan is, mm -hmm. and I'm an investor in the private Twitter too. And you know, there are so many things to fix with Twitter right now. That's like what we call Twitter 1.0 and making it better for yeah. people like you. So you can put this podcast, not just on YouTube yeah. and you can put it on Twitter and monetize it. Mm -hmm. I put all my stuff on YouTube and Twitter and I put it on Twitter because I have lots of followers there and it's a much more effective communication tool than YouTube. You know, YouTube subscribers is a whole nother thing than Twitter followers. And so we put it on both places and we get a lot of views on both places, but with Twitter, we get a ton of views and no way to monetize it in any way, shape or form. Yeah. And there's tons of ways you can monetize videos in theory on Twitter and build a huge video platform just like Spaces. And that's one of their goals. Yeah. So one of Elon's goals is to create a Spaces for video so that we could do these video chats and then you could get subscribers and do private videos, mm -hmm. you know, um, and really create unique content for people like a lot of people are doing and, and they're doing it on Twitter and they're not able to monetize it. So when they started super followers, that actually worked pretty well for people mm -hmm. um, who really try to monetize their, their, their content. And so there's a lot to what we call Twitter 1.0, where it's like, how do we just make this a really great news and communications app? Yeah. That I think he can do very, very well because these are all engineering problems and solutions and you already have users and you already have content creators who want to come on the platform and then you get the Mr. Beasts on the platform yeah. and you get these guys and the thing blows up and of that's course. how you get yeah users. that's that's you don't true get users being Elon yeah you don't get any users on payments okay because they're square and payment where you get users is Mr. Beast and unspeakable and the gamers and they've all maxed out their discords and their, and their YouTubes. And they're saying, where can I make more revenue? Where can I find new audiences? Where can I share information? And here's a whole new platform with a whole new monetization That's true. That's opportunity. True. And Mr. Beast starts doing both. And then boom, all of Mr. Beast followers, which are like 25 billion start using Twitter. So when you only have 200, plus million subscribers or users. And the let's say Facebook has 10 times that, your addressable market is, is quite larger. But when you're only news, it's not a big market. Yeah, It's just not a big market. But if you're news and entertainment, then you've got a great business. So that's, that's where I think there's mm -hmm. the most opportunity for Elon to make a big difference and for Twitter to gain users and be successful. Twitter 2.0, this sort of, Everything app, I envision just more as like a Tesla integration into the vehicles. So like the commerce and all this stuff is happening really through Tesla more than Twitter. You know, where like I'm driving home and we order like Mendocino Farms on Thursday nights and I order typically the same thing. So as I'm driving home and I typically eat at six, it would like the Tesla would know because it has AI. It's like, do you want me to order the Mendocino for you? And you push yes. And then it goes on through your car as you're driving home and orders the food. And so that's where I see my vision and where I'm pushing Twitter is to be the everything app for Tesla, not for everyone. Yeah. You see, so if you integrate Tesla's communications app with your tw with your uh, Twitter, with your Tesla profile. So every Tesla profile then has a Twitter profile. And then when I get in my car, I can see my favorite tweets, you know, and whatever. Like if you think about a world where we're not driving anymore, we do need a communications app in the car. And there you go. Okay. So now you've got an app store in Tesla 
And maybe this is all run through the Twitter teams. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. That's 2.0, that's commerce. But what I was told in the way they pitched me was the greatest thing about investing in Elon is you just don't know what that's going to be. And they didn't know about Starlink when they started SpaceX. And that was the example that was given to me, which was basically like Starlink might be the most commercially viable, successful thing SpaceX ever does. It's an incredible product. I it just is. got it. It's incredible that you can just like plug this thing in and have any internet, good internet, anywhere in the world. I mean, I'm getting like 250 megabits down, you know? <laughs> Crazy. Yeah. Anywhere in the world, and put it in my backyard. And I'm like, I got Wi Fi now out by my pool, you know, or whatever. It's like, so it's my backup Wi Fi, you know, because like I have one little cord that goes down, I, my whole thing shuts down. Yeah. You know? So now my Tesla connects to my SpaceX Starlink. Ah, uh, yeah. Nice. <laughs> when I go home, because it's by the garage, because I don't have good internet access yeah. there. And so then the Twitter comes into this ecosystem somewhere, and you've got something super interesting that could happen here with payments, commerce, uh, self driving, Uber. Especially, I think they do something with Uber at some point. Mm -hmm. I think they partner with Uber for uh, Robo Taxi. And I think then they got the Uber Eats integration. And then they put the Uber integration in your Tesla with the Twitter. And you, oh my God, this thing is amazing. Yeah. It's amazing. Yeah. Think about how amazing this stuff's going to get in five years. Yeah, from a person car, like a, a personal assistant inside of your car, more or less, or a concierge. Like or, you go, yeah. you're going to work today, Ross. Yeah, it drives me to work. Okay, we're on the way to work. Here are your stock quotes. Here are your things to do today. You know, it's like a personal assistant. You know, and then it's like, you know, oh, you've got a haircut at four. I've scheduled it for you. You mentioned that you wanted to, you know, go to the gym at three. Equinox parking lot is full. We've got a charger station. You know, like all of a sudden you've got AI in your car and you've got a communication tool. Hey, text my wife that I'll be home five minutes late. Yeah. Hey, can you make sure you order the food? I don't want, uh, you know, pizza tonight. Yeah. I don't want Chinese food. Do you want this Chinese food? Or do you so like all of a sudden this all goes through sort of Twitter as this communication tool, uh, commerce tool uh, in your Tesla, this operating system. And it's becomes this everything app, but, but I, I don't see it with people who don't own Tesla's having a huge incentive to stop using the apps they're using now. Yeah, like, they're all like a communication neural net or something. You could say like a yeah. communication brain, like like we have the full self-driving yeah. brain. Um, or it real life vision and I this do. is the brain. Yeah, with communication. Yeah, it should learn what I do. I, I, mm. I think humans have, are pretty scheduled, typically. I work out at six, mm. you know, I'm mm. done by seven. You know, it's like I eat at this time. Mm. Most people eat similar stuff, you know, yeah. like throughout the week, pizza one night, Chinese food another night, yeah. hamburger another, you know. So like, it should know this. This is not like hard. If you can drive down a street in LA, you mm. can figure out what I'm going to want for dinner. Yeah. You know what I mean? Okay, you know? Yeah. So I, I just see a huge opportunity. And, and I think that's where most people get stuck with Twitter is there, they like kind of get to this point and they go like, what is he talking about? Yeah. And you're like, he doesn't know yet, yeah. you know? He just doesn't know yet. But once they get there, see super innovative people go home at night and they think, we've been doing it this way for a long time. What's the crazy ways I could change this? Even mm -hmm. if none of them work, like just thinking that way, you know? And I think a lot of people just are scared to think that way because they might come up with some great idea that changes it. Yeah. You know? So he, he thinks about those things. And I think over the next year or two, he'll come up with some great, great ideas for Twitter and integration yeah. and, and its opportunity to become a much bigger thing. But I, I see Twitter fundamentally as information and communication mm -hmm. and that's and entertainment yeah. and that's where they'll be most successful. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. I think I, you really gave a lot of interesting points here that um, I also have to think, think about now a little bit more <laughs> and also the audience maybe because uh, it's, yeah, it's an interesting future. Also in that case, I, I think Elon, yeah. one of the things I've learned now I'm, I'm going to, I would say I'm a visionary investor, but I invest based off a vision that I see, like with electric vehicles. Like what I'm telling you is what I see in the future is that we will all, not everybody, but there will be a ton of electric cars, autonomous driving will be normal in five years. Okay, that's what I see. Okay. There's usually some version of that vision comes true. When you're thinking about Elon, you have to look way over that horizon. 
So what I see over the next five, 10 years isn't the way that Elon sees it. He's seeing like 10 to 20 yeah. into the future. And so like whenever I've limited my vision on what I think he's thinking, I've underestimated his vision. And I think that's what most of us do is we sort of underestimate his vision because he's just so crazily long-term and aggressive. And that's why Tesla has been so successful in 10 years because he knew it 10 years ago and yep. he bought the lift and he was going to need. Yeah. You know, it's even, even more so crazy than this. You just, just trust the guy. You just trust the guy. And you, you know, that's that even longer because, uh, the, the, in, in 2006, uh, it was his secret master plan part one. And it's interesting that you see the strategy that he wanted to use there is now used by legacy auto in Germany They want to focus on the premium segment, uh, makes a few premium cars and sell them for more. Right. And then, but the, right. <laughs> but it's ridiculous. It's too late. It's too late. Uh, until I, I don't know. Well, yeah, maybe. I, I mean, it's never they are strong listen, brands. It's better to do say. something than not. Yeah, you know. Yeah, they 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 but are like what Polestar is yeah. doing is Polestar is just oh, coughing. Of course, yeah. of course, you of know. Course. And I tell them, I go, that's what you want to do. You know, I recommended that they start in the United States, start including a Tesla supercharger adapter when you buy and start marketing that you can use Tesla superchargers in the United States with a Polestar. You know, it's like, just pay respect to what they've done yeah. and follow the model. It works. Like, you don't need to, like, try to reinvent something that has clearly yeah. worked, you know. And, and and that's why I like Polestar so much is they're not. Yeah. They're not trying to reinvent anything. Yeah, and I also can see that Polestar can really uh, be a luxury like in the luxury space really can be a, a great alternative. Well, they make good cars. Yeah, That's the yeah, other thing. Of course, yeah. So here's where the legacy players have an up on Tesla is if they can get the tech together, they're actually good at making cars and Tesla's not. Tesla's not good at making cars and they've worked very hard to get better. And they are better. And you hear a lot less complaints. But nobody would say Tesla's great at making cars. But yep. And so if these car companies get their tech together, they'll sell a lot of cars because they make great cars. Yeah, that's true. I mean, the build quality is awesome. From I, I've seen yeah. a Polestar in person. It's it's really crazy. And Porsche, I also like the brand the very Turbo much. Yeah. Strong beautiful. brand. It's a beautiful car. I mean, I look at those interiors and I get jealous. You know, I'm like, <laughs> man, that Taycan interior is incredible. And I used to drive them. Maserati and Aston Martin, all these kind of really nice interior European hand stitched. You know, I love that stuff. You know, I had this sweet Maserati for a while with a Ferrari engine. Since you brought up German engines, that Italian engine isn't so bad either. Yeah, yeah, of course. And, uh, yeah, you know, and and I had a British car. I had that Aston Martin too, which was probably not the best made car, but beautiful. But that's where Europe can really win is say, hey, we've got an electric car. But we're going to make a beautiful car, you know, and and you'll get lots of buyers in there, and and that's what Porsche has seen. Porsche has had a lot of success with EVs. Yeah, at this point, I just think they should license software. Please, God, don't try it. From who? Yeah, from, from, who? from, from Tesla. directly from Tesla. I don't know. Yeah, uh, that's the only one. Yeah, I know. But but they ha ha some something has to happen. If, if they don't uh, solve the software problem, I don't see like them succeeding as much. Well, but, Google's yeah. been working super hard yeah. at this. Yeah. So one of the reasons that that's been so tough is that no one company has integrated hardware and software together like Apple and Tesla. So remember, Tesla built the hardware and the software together, and Apple built the hardware and the software together. Absolutely. And what all the other companies, including Polestar, and this is Polestar's big problem too, is they've got a LiDAR-based system from Luminar, they've got NVIDIA chips, and they've got Google software. So all three of them are developing together, but there are three separate companies. And then every car company says, well, I want this nuance. I want that nuance. Yep. And Google software, from what I've heard, still has issues. You know? Yep. And now what I'm hearing is that they all have issues. Cruise, Waymo. And basically what, and this is information that is my opinion, based off conversations I've had with auto industry executives that are struggling with autonomy, that many are surrendering that. You've seen it in the news lately. Absolutely. And they're saying, we're just trying to make safer cars now. 
So autonomy maybe isn't a goal anymore for some of That's these guys. And just driver-assisted, super safe vehicles is the new goal for Tesla competitors to autonomy. Now, there was rumors yesterday about uh, Tesla needing to add LiDAR to make their system safer. And this is an issue I've spent a lot of time trying to figure out. And I'm not 100% convinced that they do need to add LiDAR, but I'm working with uh, Luminar now and their LiDAR is phenomenally good. And so I think there is something to be said and looking forward, and there was an article yesterday about Tesla adding LiDAR radars into their suite and upgrading all of their hardware now too in new models of Teslas. And it was kind of this interesting debate about it. And I think that might be a reality moving forward if you're really going to have robo -tests. Yeah. But I think level three, they've achieved. And I think level four is achievable yeah. in Tesla. The question is, can they achieve level five with the current hardware? And I don't know if they can, but I don't know if that matters because their competitors are struggling on level three now. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that's interesting. So we could summarize the episode more or less that Tesla is on a good path right now. Uh, still, the fundamentals haven't changed. They even I'll, I'll, I'll take it a step further. Yeah, Tesla is in the best position they've ever been in their company history. In the entire time that they've been alive, they've never had a stronger financial position, a greater market share in the market, a, a, a proven success in their products and services, and two massively important products launching next year as they scale two new massive factories. So when you think out past even a year, you think the next three years for Tesla as an investor today, this is just a, it's just a massive opportunity. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it is. I, I totally agree with you. And um, it's so astonishing to see like 50 percent growth year over year growth doesn't lie you can really see that even if you're not like this financial savvy if you look at the earnings reports or the the, right. the summaries of them i mean it's really easy to spot how how successful they are and um yeah, yeah it's 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 crazy how 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 they still are dragged so 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 low right now it's it's crazy to see well, that once again if you if you get on twitter if you read the news articles over the last uh, 30 days about Elon and Twitter and Tesla. I mean, you would think he was going out and shooting Twitter employees in the back yeah. and burying them like Russians. You know what I mean? And he has a torture chamber in the basement. Yep. Now they're investigating the Twitter HQ had some people sleeping there and somebody reported them in the San Francisco where literally Some people sleep on the streets every night, but they're going to go investigate that Elon has a few people sleeping at the HQ that's been empty, okay? And in California, there's actually a bill to allow companies to uh, change their uh, offices into apartment buildings because there's no demand for office buildings anymore. And, like, this is literally the effort people are making to cause Elon harm. And upsetness and it's just a bunch of bitter media people that elon took their toy and is going to fix it okay no. so so elon's failure is he's not a master of the media yeah okay but to his credit he doesn't care and he's going to do what he's going to do and it's all a bunch of stuff so if you get off twitter and you stop reading all the news and you go out and you see a hundred new teslas on the road yeah you're like, what you're doing great you know and so it's like We live in this like hyper short term news cycle where then we get bombarded by negative stuff all the time. And then we sell our stock because we believe in this short termism and this garbage. Yeah. And that's exactly what's happened to Tesla. It's been a super tough market. So then that feeds into it. So you add a level of risk to the stock in a super tough market and institutions are saying no. Yeah. And that's Elon's fault. So it's Elon's fault that he's created this thing, but to, His credit, the company's doing great, and that's what really matters. Yeah. And so he step away from Tesla for now. The stock loses a certain amount of valuation because of that. That's what's happened. And he will come back to Tesla at some point because I'm sure very soon he will be very sad. Working in media sucks. Yeah. So I'll leave you with this story. When I started doing lots of TV shows, I was on CNBC and Fox like all the time when I started doing TV and about you know seven eight years ago 
And I, I had uh, a lunch with Liz Clayman, who runs a show on Fox Business News. Mm-hmm. And, and I, she, I was trying to learn more about like which direction I was going with my career because I like investing more than I like to do television. And she said, you know, Ross, what's your goal with media? Are, are you trying to be on a show? Are you trying to be like a finance guy on CNBC or Fox? Or are you just like wanting to be in a show to promote your business and talk about your companies and, and you like being an investor? And I go, no, I don't want to be in the media. You know, like I'm using the media to, to get clients and to build my company, you know? And she goes, you're very smart. She said, don't go into this business. <laughs> wow. This is the worst business in the world. It's a miracle I've made it through all these years in this industry. But please listen to me. Don't go into this business. I said, I don't want <laughs> wow. to. Wow. Okay. That's. Okay. Media is a real, real tough nightmare business. And, and I think Elon will get tired of it. Yeah. So don't worry, Tesla people. He'll be back yeah. with robots. And, and the Cybertruck's going to be a bitch to build. So he'll be back yeah. in the first quarter, probably trying to get Cybertruck production up, yeah. panicking, working the line again. But I, t- I say this to anybody. If you got the richest person in the world willing to work 80, 100 hours a week to be successful, you want to invest with these people. Yeah. Okay. I got CEOs at the golf course every day. You know what I mean? I got CEOs going home. I got Tim Cook. He's home in bed by eight every night. You know what I mean? Yeah. So I bet on winners. I'm going to keep betting on Elon Musk till he dies. Yeah. That's the way. Yeah, well, yeah, very interesting stuff. For the end of the episode, I just want to get to know some some stuff you do more. And I, I mean, you have your investing firm, for example. Maybe you want to plug something that's now the opportunity to do that because oh, I think we really uh, went through all the arcs uh, that that I've wanted to touch on. And um, I think for our audience, well, I've got a great, I've got a great fund you can buy. It's certainly cheap. Um, so <laughs> of my course, fund GK, you can buy it um, through your brokerage firms and whatever, and it gives you exposure to everything we talk about. Yep. So, you know, you can join on and, and my fund is super cheap right now. And, you know, Tesla's down 50% and we're down about 35. So our, you know, diversification has helped blunt some of that decline. Yeah. But you can buy into the fund now, ride this thing all the way back up. Yeah. Plus, we've got all these other wonderful investments throughout uh, technology and, and clean energy. Um, but, you know, secondly, you know, I think we do provide financial services in Europe. And as much as investing is an important part of what we do, it's not as important as your financial plan. Yeah. And so what I, we typically tell people, especially if you're younger, you know, there's no better time to reach out. You can actually work with a financial advisor at my firm now because of technology. Yeah. And we're the first firm actually doing this. And the European regulators haven't figured this out yet. Yeah. But we're doing business all throughout Europe without a physical location. Yeah, of course. Zoom and global. And we're, I think, the first American investment firm that can provide financial planning advice to European. And what, yeah. it, what it turns out is the way it works in Europe is unless you have a lot of money, nobody's there to help you because the banks are where you get financial advice typically. And you have to have like millions and millions of dollars yeah. for a financial advisor because it's a super elitist system, actually. Yeah. So what my firm has done is democratize financial advice for people doesn't matter how much money you have we're going to give you financial advice and now we offer those services in europe so if you're looking to just get some advice we're learning about the different pension systems and investment opportunities but but we're happy to work with you and we're able to work with clients in europe either through charles schwab or through von tobel securities if you have a, a higher level of assets so so certainly if you have questions you want to get invested we're definitely the firm to help you whether you're okay. in the United States. Yeah, that's cool. Um, my, my audience, just so, so you know, is mostly American, but I also have like 10%, 15% from Europe. Well, of we course, take a 20. few Americans too. Yeah, yeah. of course. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so thank you, Ross, very much to to have you on the podcast. I'm I'm very excited to to uh, listen to you. And it's it was very great to uh, listen to your points because I, I think you uh, changed my sentiment on Twitter a little bit because... Yeah, I, I'm I'm a little hesitant still, but but I get your point. Um, it's it's interesting to see that maybe we don't have to look at uh, the horizon as much as the the like the just the short term. And uh, yeah. Elon will be back at uh, twi- uh, at Tesla, of course. Uh, that's what I also see on the horizon. And um, but but I also see it's a great opportunity for Tesla right now that um, people see we don't really need Elon at Tesla right, right. now. And that's I, that's going to be a, a push for the stock as well, I think. Uh, and and I would I would add one more point to that, yeah. point, which is a really good one, is it's giving the people at Tesla an opportunity to grow. Yeah, you know he's pretty overbearing. Yeah, he is. Yeah. And so what's happening right now at Tesla, and I've had many conversations with them about this, 
is the team that actually does run Tesla every day, it's like they've been almost like freed to be like who they are and grow up. And this is actually what needs to happen at Tesla. So even though a lot of people might think it's a negative that he's not there every day right now, it's actually a positive because the goal is to run a business that won't need Elon forever. And if Tesla's going to be a $3 trillion company, it's not going to be because Elon's there every day driving it there. It's going to be because there's a team in place that can grow this business. And I always leave it, you know, when Steve Jobs died at Apple, I was like, oh my God, what do I do? Yeah. And I was like, I guess I'll give Tim Cook a chance. And that was a thousand percent ago because Steve Jobs had the vision to find somebody like Tim and built such a great team that it's yeah. lasted for well over a decade. And hopefully Elon will be, this is what is happening. Irrelevant, I think even Elon wanting because it's just a natural byproduct of such a big business having its CEO doing something else and all the other leaders step up. That's yeah. what happens. And I also can see that if Elon comes back, he will maybe see that that things run smooth and they, he says, oh, okay, maybe I need to step back a little bit and maybe we have a better Tesla version then. Um, I don't know. Maybe maybe it's, it's, it's a also, different it's dynamic. It's also a yeah. testament to a good, being a good manager. Of I course. At my company sometimes because they sometimes think I'm overbearing and whatever. And I'll just be like, fine, I, I won't deal with anything for like a month. You guys deal with it, you know? And it's like, in some ways I'm like, whatever. And then they all step up and I'm like, that was a good idea. Yeah. You know, now I don't have to worry about this issue anymore because, you know, maybe I was, you know, yeah. overcompensating yeah. on the micromanagement side. And what's been told to me over and over again is the team at Tesla is kicking butt and they're doing great. And we don't need Elon Musk there every day, nor was he doing everything every day. Of when course. He yeah. It's a, re it's it's a huge action. operation. Yeah. How, how could he, how could yeah, he? It's massive. <laughs> so with innovation, ideas, the pressure, he's still the CEO, he's crucially of important, course. don't get me wrong. Yeah. Uh, when you're running a massive company, like this happened to me at my company, we have 45 people the other day, I'm doing my team meetings, and I'm hearing stuff, and I'm like, you guys did that? Like, I never even had anything to do with any of this. And they weren't bad decisions, they were good decisions. Yeah. But I was like, sort of impressed that they were actually like making these decisions I had no idea about, and I didn't want to discourage it. But yeah. I was a little bit annoyed too because I was like, "Why didn't you tell me this?" Yeah. But then I was like, "No, no, this is good." Of course, it is. Yeah, I want them to grow and not need to ask me for all these things. And if they were bad decisions, then I'd step in. But they were fine decisions, and so I was kind of happy about it in the end. I was like, you know, yeah, that's kind of cool. I, I better keep doing these meetings so I know yeah. about it. Yeah, I, I mean, you know? that's that's like when your company gets bigger, you yeah. get further away yeah. from the day to day stuff. And Tesla's massive now. Yeah, and, and that's also a success story of Tesla as well, because um, they, they really uh, encourage people to use their own head. And that's important yeah. to do. Yeah, and, and yeah we, you don't have to micromanage all the time. It's, it's, it's a waste of resources. And uh, also, oh. it, sometimes you need it, but, but it depends. If it's a huge fire to put out, then the CEO has to step in. But, yeah, you yeah. have to step in. Yeah. Tesla's team, whenever I go there, it's so fun, because I use it for my motivation. Yeah, you know? yeah, it's inspiring. I get there yeah. and I start talking to people, and it doesn't matter if it's somebody working on the line or an engineer or a FSD person. It's like I, I, I'm like, damn, I, I could work harder. I could do more. Like it's just like infectious. And I get back to my company, and I'm like, guys, like, <laughs> you gotta, gotta do more. Yeah. <laughs> it's just like the people there are the best in the world at what they do. And it's like when you're around the best, it's like it's just like wonderful. Yeah, it's just wonderful, and yeah. and that's what he's doing at Twitter. So keep in mind, the people working at Twitter deserve to be fired. I mean, nobody likes to hear that life isn't so nice, but they did a crappy job. Yeah, they at did. every level, they did not protect our country from manipulation, and and they helped uh, terrorist organizations like ISIS, and that's why they all lost their jobs. Just like the guy you fired the other day, who was the one suppressing, you know, the Hunter Biden whatever. So we all know the guys in there were doing what was best for them. And now he's cleaning the house. And, and of course, there's this big, but now you're starting to see the pendulum swing back. Yeah. Now it's swinging back because they're firing everybody at CNN right now, too. Everyone. The same thing. And David Zaslav, he's worse than Elon. He's way worse. This guy's like HBO, you cut that girl, wasn't being made, you know, billions in write offs. He is redoing CNN and he's going to do a great job. And I talk to people in Hollywood and they go, he's going to do a great job. 
But you talk to people at, at, at Warner Brothers, they're like, he's the devil, you yeah. know? Yeah. And that's business. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, pretty interesting times now that with with all that, um, yeah, it, it it had a halo effect on 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 many companies. I mean, you've you've seen in the tech space that I've got CEOs calling me that's like they don't want to say anything publicly, but they're like, thank Elon for doing this. Now we can we do that. Yeah, we want employees back in the office. We want people. We want productivity. This millennial fantasy that working from home is somehow more productive. It's over. Yeah, and Elon is the guy that spurred corporate America to get tough with the kids again and make them come back to work. Yeah. <laughs> and so I've got CEOs calling me and saying, thank Elon for me because I couldn't go out and do it like that because my team, I can't do it even with my team, <laughs> yeah. but I've wanted them back for months, you know, and I've got most of them back without force, fortunately, Yeah. but, but our team is much better off. And, and so I think what we'll see is a massive transfer, uh, transformation at Twitter. Yeah. And then, Uh, in business school, you'll be studying this in five or 10 years. Maybe not as like, this is the way to do it, yeah. but this is, this is a, case study. a way to do yeah. it. Yeah. You know? Yeah, that's right. Wow. Yeah. Interesting yeah. times. <laughs> so Ross, thanks again uh, for, yeah, for, for being here. And um, I hope we can speak again someday. I'm going to reach out oh, to you again. It. Yeah. Best of our lives. Uh, follow up. Uh, yeah. On, on everything. Well, no, if you're, listen, I uh, good luck with what you're doing. Thank you. I'm happy to come on again. Yeah. Maybe check in in six months or whatever yeah. where we're at. Um, I, I maintain a global presence. I, I love the world. Yeah. You know, and, and so, you know, we do serve investors in your market and, and I'm happy to help your podcast and, yeah. and help you, you know, build what you're doing because it yeah. hopefully will make a difference for Germans and Yeah, I ho hope so too. Because I also want to see them win. I I, I don't like to yeah. see like shooting them themselves into the knee. I don't yeah. I don't want to see that. Who wants that? And, and, and you know what? We all deserve better from our governments. Yeah, we yeah. all deserve better. Yeah. So we've all been manipulated by the Russians and the Saudis and the money for the last five years. Okay, yeah. and we saw where it got us. Yeah. But we, as a collective, free society, we deserve better from yeah. our governments. It's corruption. Yeah, so that's hopefully true. the the the, uh, the Germans will stand up now and like Americans, like we saw in the election last night, the Republicans are not winning. Okay, because our democracy is saying if you're a Trumper, we don't want you. That's what's happening in America. Yeah. So we are okay with Republicans, but this whole right wing thing, nobody won. And how did we get it in the first place? Russia, mm. Saudi Arabia, social media manipulation. Mm politicians money and it's time for it to change so so young people are going to lead that change and people like you so good luck <laughs> thanks thank you very much ross so to yeah. everybody there's only uh, one last thing to say now goodbye everybody yeah goodbye